Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders, viewable through M. Oppenheim TV and YouTube. Today, we're chatting about how to vote. Voting. It's going to be election day. So let's talk about voting with our special guest, Deborah Cleaver, founder and CEO of Vote America. Deborah, it's so great to have you here. I'm so excited. We're going to all get to vote about our future. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. So you're you're a serial entrepreneurial founder of, of all these different organizations, uh, Voter Future, Vote America, electionday.org, vote.org, long distance voter, swing the state. You're a person who believes in voting. How about that? Right? An American who believes in voting. Talk a little bit about the impetus behind your founding of these various organizations and Vote America now. Um, so first, I want to say every organization I've started has been nonpartisan. When you do this work, as long as I have, people assume that you work for a political party. I don't work for a political party. Um, I focus on people and people participating in elections. And it's because when more people participate, we elect people who share our values and pass popular policies. Or to put this another way, when we have low turnout, that's how we get politicians who back things that are wildly unpopular. Um, and I can give you an example. Uh, Banning abortion is wildly unpopular. Over 70% of Americans on all sides of the aisle and the political spectrum believe in a woman's right to choose. And yet we're now facing nationwide abortion bans. And that's what happens when we have low turnout. The people who are elected just aren't accountable to the people. So, um, Mark, you and I have spoken about this before. I want to live in a functioning civil society where people can live their lives and thrive and excel. And I have just focused on increasing turnout as a way of supporting civil society. But if I wanted to vote against choice mm -hmm. and for restrictions on abortion, would you help me vote? I would. Um, I have registered slightly over 7 million people to vote over the past 20 years. And I have helped people whose values align with mine and whose values don't align with mine, because the whole point of a functioning society is that we all get to participate. Right. So whether you're on the, the way each side couches it, one side couches it as uh, pro-life, the other side accounts as it, it pro-choice, for abortion, anti-abortion. In terms of your mission, in terms of your, your, you basically want us to have that discussion and you want to have us have that discussion at the ballot box, right? So your point is that a strong civil society has to make room for all voices to be heard through their votes, through their participation in these, in, in these discussions, in these debates. I mean, that's what a democracy is. Just because you don't agree with someone's viewpoint doesn't mean they don't have the right to share it and to participate. So let, let's sort of unpack on who votes and who doesn't vote, because I think that what is what is interesting is that if everybody were equally inclined to vote, either everybody would vote or nobody would vote. So different groups, different age groups have different challenges, different levels of wealth, different parts of the country. Where do you see people um, having very easy access to vote and voting and having the education and, and so on uh, to vote and the time to vote? And where do you see problems that need to be overcome? Um, okay, so you actually hit the nail on the head in your question. Um, older Americans are more likely to vote. Wealthier Americans are more likely to vote. Um, I would say older people are more likely to vote because they have more experience voting and have had more time to see the direct relationship between casting a ballot and what happens. Um, wealthier Americans also are more likely to vote. They benefit from the policies that unpopular people pass. Um, and also they're more likely to have time off to vote. 
um, younger people are less likely to vote, lower income people are less likely to vote. There's a bunch of reasons for this. Um, one thing that we think about a lot is that partisan groups just spend more time and more money on older people and wealthier people and are more likely to ignore young people. But then there's also very like brass tax reasons that young people and uh, less wealthy people don't vote. They move more often. And every time you move, you need to register to vote again. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, there are some regional differences in who votes, but it's it's probably not what you think. Everyone thinks that people in swing states vote at the highest rates and they do vote at high rates, but the highest turnout is in states that make voting uh, more convenient. Like specifically the states that have universal vote by mail, which means every registered uh, voter receives a ballot in the mail, they have the highest turnout. So that's states like California, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Utah, Colorado, they have the highest turnout. And you'll notice not one of those states is a swing state. So we see higher turnout in states that make voting more accessible. What, what, what would be the argument? And, and I, I, I take it you would support uh, that type of, a, you know, send, send a ballot to everyone through the mail, you know, based on their address. I, I take it you support that, right? Oh, absolutely. So you, you've talked with people who would argue against it, or you know what the arguments are. What, what are the arguments against doing that? Okay, first I want to say that I haven't heard a single valid argument against doing that. Um, voting by mail increases participation and decreases the cost to run an election because it's really expensive to have polling places. And it's really expensive to have to map individual citizens to their designated polling places and to staff polling places. So it is just simply less expensive to mail everyone a ballot and then just let them return it to a voting center or a Dropbox. Um, people say that- Oh, it's known as cost benefits. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're in the states that have passed universal vote by mail. There's been bipartisan support for it because it's just significantly less expensive. Um, I've heard people say that we're more likely to have fraud if we vote by mail. That's probably the thing I've heard most often, but it's not true. And I'll tell you, I've why. heard that. I've heard that true. Th that too. So what they're saying, what they're saying is, if if, if everybody gets a ballot that there will be people who will take that ballot, submit it, but it's not really the person to whom it's addressed. It's not a so, registered voter, right? So first, the post office won't deliver a ballot if the person it's addressed to doesn't live at that address. I, you know, we have change of address. The post office also just, they know, they know who lives there. Like my mailman, he is a man. Like he knows everyone who lives in every apartment. Second, every ballot that goes out has a barcode on it on the inside of the ballot and the return envelope. And if the one that comes back, the envelope isn't the same that was sent out, it wasn't counted. You have to sign your ballot and your signature on your ballot is compared to the signature uh, when you register to vote. And also, I want to say that this isn't hypothetical that we have states that have universal vote by mail. This has been a reality for an exceptionally long time. And we simply do not have higher cases of um, voter fraud in those states. Also, Americans have been voting by mail since the Civil War. Like, this is not a new thing at all. It's nothing new. Nothing new. And also, the entire military votes by mail. So... You know, there's no reason to think that mailing people ballots will cause problems. And also we have actual hard evidence now that it simply doesn't, but it does reduce the cost of the election and it increases the number of people who vote. So what you're saying is that a suspicion isn't as good as a fact. I, I'm absolutely saying that, Mark. And we have like decent number of states that have universal vote by mail. I want to say six, including California, which is the largest state in the country. And we have no issues with this. And it isn't just blue states that vote by mail. Utah votes by mail and they embrace vote by mail because it's so much more affordable. So it increases participation. Voters love it. Election officials love it as well. And the post office is the most trusted uh, government agency 
we have. I mean, I think they have a 97% approval rate. So the only legitimate reasons to oppose vote by mail is you don't want people to vote. And that's not legitimate in a so democracy. If if what you're saying is that the people with the highest propensity to vote are people who are wealthier and people who are older, is it that the wealthier, older people are, that they don't want to lose power by having um, the voting? Uh, what's going on here? I don't quite... I don't quite get it because honestly, it's not opposed by people. It's I, more partisan opposition right now. I mean, there's no complicated answer here. There are just people who hold elected office who don't want people to vote um, because citizens, once they have universal vote by mail, they love it. They love it. Also, I should say in all of these states that have universal vote by mail, if you want to vote in person, you can. You just bring your ballot with you yeah. to a polling center. I've done so, both. Yeah, I've done both as well. So it's the best of both worlds. You can still vote by mail because there are, there are people who just love voting by mail. Um, so it's the best of both worlds. There's no legitimate reason to oppose it. We've had it for too long. I mean... I don't take it. As well, we might as well do it. But 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 what do you do? OK, so so now you're trying to encourage people to vote. We know what your position is. You know, we should all vote by mail, but we're not all voting by mail. What else? I, I will say my position is we should all vote, period. I just have noticed that in the states that have vote by mail, we have the highest turnout. So what, what else are you doing to uh, encourage voting? Okay, so we have a couple of very big programs we're running this year. One of them is we have spent $7 million on billboards that let people know the date of the election. The single best predictor of whether or not you vote is if you know the date of the election, because the election date changes every year. Um, so a surprising number of people just don't know when it is. I mean, they're busy with other things. And it's not like your taxes. Everyone knows taxes are due April 15th. If election day was always November 15th, we would have no reason to put up these billboards. But we've put up hundreds and hundreds of billboards that let people know the date of the election. We've been doing this for years and we actually study whether or not they work. And we can show using data, this is very nerdy, that the people who live closer to the billboards vote at a higher rate. So we love the billboards. Again, they're nonpartisan. Um, and they also tell people that there will be record high turnout this year, because if you tell people that everyone else is voting, they will vote. People do fear of missing out. People do not like to be left behind. Very effective message. Um, and another program that we're running that we've been running for years is a college media program. You probably know what college radio is. Uh, colleges also have newspapers. Uh, they have physical ads, and digital ads. So we run paid ad campaigns on colleges where we let students know the date of the election. Um, we let them know the voter registration deadline. 22 states and District of Columbia have same day registration. You can register and vote at the same time on election day. We let the students know this. Um, we let them know that they have to bring ID to the polls. And these are just informational campaigns. You'll notice I haven't said the name of anyone running for office. We don't talk about issues. We just let people know when and where to vote. And that increases turnout. Well, that's so interesting. You're, you're, you're basically just telling people vote on November, November 5th. 5th. November, November 5th. November 5th. Yep. November 5th. November 5th. November 5th. Vote. Vote. Remember, vote. November 5th, right? You're basically making it easier. Yep. Um, you're not telling them who to vote for. You're just saying, be a citizen, participate, be part of this. So I have a, I have a question. What do you think is going on here? I grew up in a naive sense of believing in truth, justice in the American way, like in the old uh, Superman kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? Truth, justice, America. Americans vote, right? The autocrats didn't vote. They didn't vote in Stalinist Russia. They didn't vote in 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 the Soviet Union, right? They we voted, right? They're not mm -hmm. voting in in North Korea. We voted, right? Uh, 
I don't get, I mean, that seemed to be such a core. What do you think is going on here? Is this really a struggle about power and then using the vote and people getting a vote to, to keep and acquire power? Or have, are we falling apart as a country? What is, what is your sense? Yeah, these are such good questions. Um, so first, I would say that underfunding public education for 50 years hasn't done us any favors. Oh, that's interesting. So, so social studies and those kinds of things. And history where- and geography. And, you know, when I was in high school, we had an entire semester long class on just how government worked. And I can guarantee everyone who was in that class votes. Like, oh, it's only a bill and I'm sitting up on Capitol Hill, right? So, that, that, that whole, so we all learned those a lot of service announcements, right? About that. Um, I, you are correct that this is about power. Something that I always think about is that the people who are changing the laws to make it harder for people to vote were voted into office. So once they have power, they're essentially making it harder to remove them from office. And uh, a fair number of people have lost sight of the fact that a rising tide really does lift all boats meaning that when we all do better, we all do better. So when we had uh, higher taxes and, you know, we had more middle class citizens and we had greater prosperity overall, and now we have billionaires. And those billionaires are essentially trying to buy elected officials so that they do not have to pay their fair share of taxes. So we're, we've like hit a rocky point as a country, but it doesn't mean that we won't right the ship. Like I do believe ultimately that Americans want the same thing. We want clean air, clean water. We want our children to do better than we did personally. We want safe and secure housing. We also want freedom from having to monitor our own government for corruption. Right. I mean, I, I would say It's not that I'm naive. It's just that I had never experienced such open corruption until recently. And this is unthinkable. Like what actually makes America great is that we held our own elected officials to the laws. So the idea that a a president could be a king and would just be above the law is really new. And it's actually not correct. And it's not healthy. Also, a smaller scale example, because I'm from New York. I mean, right now, um, the, New York Adams, City, right? Yeah, the New York City mayor is in a lot of hot water because uh, he's allegedly been taking bribes, as has his entire administration. And like, this is just not, it's not good for any of the citizens. So um, you were correct. This is about power. Sometimes the people who seek office um, really just want personal power. But the overwhelming majority of people who seek office really just want to do right by citizens. There are 519,000 elected officials in the United States. And the overwhelming majority of them just want to live in a functioning civil society. So, you know, I remain confident that when more of us vote, we'll, we will elect better politicians who will pass more popular policies. And I really do believe that. I've been doing nonpartisan work for 20 years, and I have always resisted the urge to do partisan work. Well, one of the one of the things that I think is interesting is the connection that we're drawing here between um, corruption and and our our tolerance of corruption, our tolerance of lying, our tolerance of uh, not serving civil society, civil, c- serving others, and this whole idea of of erosion of the vote is part of this. Also, the fact that our communication uh, methodologies, modalities, um, kind of um, enable and and reward. Um, lies, misinformation, fear mongering, and so on and so forth. That instead of instead of um, instead of ensuring that there's an equal playing field, it's basically the people with the ability to fund end up having the voice. Right? We don't really have um, what we what we had for so long, which is a rich media ecosystem 
with a lot of newspapers and, you know, there were always the upstarts. There was always the right and left and the various. Right now we've got a few platforms and it's basically sucked up um, a lot of the dialogue. And those dial those platforms are rewarding people who get a lot of clicks and views. So you can create a lie that gets more clicks than the truth. And all of a sudden, you don't know what's right, what's true. And then you just don't vote because you just don't know. You're just like, oh, screw it. We'll, we'll. It's the answer is yes. And I have a journalist friend who reminds me we've always had yellow journalism, which yeah. is to say propaganda the passes for journalism. He's like, we've always had that. I would say the thing that has changed is the speed at which something inaccurate can be distributed. You know, I mean, the internet is just very fast. Um, so we see things that aren't truthful get distributed to a huge audience faster than we used to. Um, you are correct in that clickbait hasn't done us any favors. You know, having journalists write or editors write really sensational headlines hasn't done any favors. So this isn't great. Um, we also used to regulate uh, a newspaper's owner, like ability to use that just for propaganda. Um, I think we used to, I'm trying to think of how to put this. Twitter. Well, remember the old the old Soviet mouthpiece Pravda, which means truth? What an irony, right? Um, and it was just, it, it was just, um, uh, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of lies strung together to serve the purposes of, of those in power in the Soviet Union. Wait, I can give you an example of something that has changed definitely not for the better. So the presidential debates used to be moderated by the League of Women Voters, mm -hmm. not by a network, by this like trusted nonprofit brand. And they would absolutely fact check candidates. So you simply could not lie during a presidential debate. And at some point, first of all, we moved away from the League of Women Voters to letting networks moderate right. debates. It was a huge mistake. And now we don't fact check candidates. And that is a very wild decision because these we're giving them airspace to spread lies. So uh, things things have happened that haven't been great for us. And like we simply should not let people who are running for office lie without being called. Well, out I thought that was time. interesting the other day with the non vice presidential debates where uh, one of the uh, candidates wa was upset that, hey, I thought the rules were that you weren't going to check. By the uh, way, it is nonpartisan to use people's names. So I will. J.D. Vance, who is currently running for vice president of the United States, told a lie and the moderator pointed out that he wasn't being truthful. And he responded immediately with, I thought you weren't going to fact check, which has become a clip that has gone viral. Um, and I, you know what, I, I can't, I can't imagine how anyone benefits from not fact checking. And the uh, interesting thing to me, Mark, was that he knew he had told a lie. It wasn't that he was mistaken. Um, so I'm I'm actually glad that we saw that happen. But I think we're also witnessing a um, evolution of definitions, whereas fact, what he actually meant was you were not going to distinguish between lie and truth. That's really what he meant. And I think we're seeing uh, words and phrases being appropriated in a way that makes it ambiguous as to as to what is factual and what is not factual. Um, I, I witnessed this uh, when I was very young with people who were um, on the debate stage. This was this was even when I was in high school. There were people who were performers, and there were people who had all of the facts. And sometimes the performers would gather a lot of attention, even though they had a totally hollow argument. I think we as human beings are very susceptible to uh, form over substance. Mm -hmm. That's why we have this form over substance thing. And and the question is, how? what is the antidote for that? So let's talk a little bit about, because uh, we're coming to the end of our time, let's talk a little bit about some practical things that we can do. After this show, I'm going to be going out and I'm going to be talking with people. I will also vote on November 5th. But as I talk with other people, how should I function in this world? What should I be doing to try and heal 
what I see is a bad direction of, of, of basically um, not having people tell the truth, uh, not engaging with other people, people not talking to each other. How should I? How should I function? What can, what measures can I take? Should I be writing a check to a political party or to you or to I mean, what? What should I be doing? Well, I run a nonprofit, so yes, you should absolutely write a check to Vote America, voteamerica.org. Donations are tax deductible. Um, I personally don't write checks to political parties because the amount of money being spent um, is insane. It feels it's stunning. It feels unethical to me, like partisan groups will spend $15 billion this year. Most of that will go to broadcast TV ads that no one sees. And $15 billion is enough for us to make people's lives better or for us to run TV ads. So I think the amount of spending is unethical. But one thing I try to do in my day-to-day life is just model good behavior. Like if someone disagrees with me, I don't shout at them. I actually try to figure out where the All disagreements. The I don't. One thing I actually do as a person is I will steer the conversation away from things that we disagree about towards the things that we do agree about with almost anyone. Like I am not willing to fight with people, whether they're family, we all have family members who are a little crazy or they're just people I meet as I go through life. I'll say, you know what, we don't agree on this, but I bet there's something we do agree on and you can immediately shift the conversation and neutralize it because really most of us want to get along and it will not be hard to find something that you agree with another person on. And then I can say, look, maybe we don't agree on the best way for us to get there, but we agree what the goal is. Um, And once you shift away from yelling at someone, the other person will also shift away. And we need to get back to a place where we can be like, okay, so we don't completely agree on the solution, but we agree on the goal. That's how we move forward as a society. You're talking about standards of behavior. You're yes. talking about common yes. courtesy, right? Yeah, just courtesy. I mean, we have to, you know, Tim Walz does something that I really love. He always talks about neighbors. Like he says, these are my neighbors. And like, we have to get along with neighbors. And once you're like, once he reminds us of that, he's like, look, we have to find commonality with each other. It is so much easier for us to move together towards a common goal when we remember the other person is a person. They're not a bad person. They're not a monster. Like maybe we don't agree on the best things. But me personally, I just shift the conversation. I find the thing that we agree about. You know what? Sometimes it's sports. Sometimes just just find the thing. Like it is healthier for us all to go through life not yelling at people. And uh, we can find something. I don't know. I helped a much younger friend start a pet rescue, like a cat rescue. And I can take us from talking about a contentious issue to talking about cats and dogs pretty quickly. And once you have like this basis of things you both care about and you both like, it is so much easier to calmly discuss the things you don't agree on. So that is my trick. I recommend that to people. There is no sense in yelling at people. Find the thing you agree on. Great recommendation, but I have one final question for you, and this is this is something that really stymies me. As I said when I was growing up, right, this whole idea of telling the truth, that was not controversial. The whole idea of voting, right, everybody should vote, that was not controversial. Now, if you if you tell the truth or you do a fact check or you encourage people to vote, you're going to be accused as be of being partisan which is a little mind blowing for me. What do you, what do you do when people say because of what you've said on this show that shows you're partisan, right? The whole uh, the, the 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 fact that you pointed to JD Vance's uh whole thing about, you know, I I thought you weren't going to ch- check check my facts, that's a bad thing, right? That that could be viewed as a, as a partisan comment. Right, um, that you are registering people who are 18 years old as are just getting in, that that could be viewed as partisan, that you're putting up billboards saying, vote, 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 and that more people vote in those areas, that could be viewed as partisan. How do you deal with the fact that now, if if you do anything, 
you're going to be accused of being partisan and if you and and also you could be lied about right all these weapons you could be lied about so how do how do you personally deal with with all of that I have a pretty thick skin. I mean, you don't you don't do what I do for this many years without having pretty thick skin. Uh, but I have I push back. I mean, we have this initiative called futurevoter.com and it helps people who are under 18 uh, pre-register to vote, which a lot of states have. You could actually pre-register before you're 18 years old. I and know that. and um the Federalist did a full hit piece on it. The Federalist isn't online magazine and they were saying this is the high schooler to democratic capital d pipeline and i just wrote in and i was like it's really interesting to me that you assume a young person will automatically be a democrat has the republican party done something that is alienating young people and i mean they don't have an answer to that and i will just stick to the truth what we do is nonpartisan. we will help anyone who wants to vote vote and cast a ballot. And as if as a country, we reach the point where we associate simply helping people register to vote with working for the Democratic Party, that is a problem. Because when I was growing up, obviously, both sides of the aisle would help people register and vote. And I think, um, oh, yeah, I will say that I, we have been accused of being partisan because people say if you increase voter turnout, you will increase turnout for the Democratic Party. I'm not actually sure if that's true, but if that is true, that's a problem for the Republican Party to solve, not for us. I mean, anyone who's running for office should be confident that they can win based on their policy and their platform. And if that isn't the case, then they need to change their policies and platforms I've been called a lot worse things than a Democrat. I've also been called a Republican. Just, you know, I've been called all sorts of things, uh, but it will always be better. Society will be healthier if more people vote. And you started this by saying people don't get to vote in North Korea. They don't get to vote in Russia or if they do, the elections are rigged. Voting is what makes America great. That is what makes America great. The fact that we could elect and remove our leaders makes people great. What a great note to go uh, off on. Deborah Cleaver, founder and CEO of Vote America. Thank you so much for your, for your work. Thank your people. Uh, please thank your funders. And thank you for holding the center. It is not right that you fold in the face of accusations that are false. Nobody should fold in the face of accusations that are false. If people call you partisan, and what you're doing is calling for voting of American citizens, then you are not partisan. You're an American. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Deborah. Hello, I'm Deborah Cleaver, founder and CEO of VoteAmerica.org. The election is coming. Election day is November 5th, which means it's time to make your plan to vote. Uh, there are a couple of steps. First, we want you to make sure your voter registration is current. Visit VoteAmerica.org and we will help you do that. Um, second, we want you to decide if you're going to vote in person or by mail. If you're going to vote by mail, it's time to order your ballot. We can help you with that at VoteAmerica.org. Um, you should decide if you're going to vote early. Almost every state has early voting, and we should just call that weekend voting because early voting lets you vote on the weekend. Finally, if you're going to vote on Election Day, it's Tuesday, November 5th. And in most places, you will have to bring an ID with you when you vote. So bring a government issued ID with you when you vote. Visit voteamerica.org and we will help you make your plan to vote.